Craig, Pastor Craig has been uh, introducing to us the book of Daniel again. And we're, I've talked to a few people around here, and we're all quite excited about it. It's really quite good. Last week, he spent some time giving us some, some background and some history, some prehistory before it was written, and who the people were and things like that. And it got me thinking, who were we? Bamp Park Church. How did we get here? Where are we going? Those types of questions. And it caused me to, once again, pull out something that we haven't seen for a while, and I don't want to go into d deep detail about it, but it is our vision statement and our vision, uh, our core values statement. So I'd like to read those to you again. Starting 2022, this is a good thing to be reminded of and uh, reread. It's certainly on our website. Uh, we find a lot of people find us through the website, and so it's a good thing to have there for, to explain who we are. For the vision statement, it is simply this. Ministering in the Bow Valley and impacting our world by being a biblical community where Jesus is present, grace is shown, truth is loved, and people are valued. That's who we are. The motto comes from that, of course, and it is, Jesus is present here, grace is shown here, truth is loved here, and people are valued here. It's something we should be reminded out about and uh, try to memorize, really. The, the five statements, I won't uh, read all of the, uh, the background on them, but they are that we believe in biblical authority. We value authentic worship. We value biblical community. We value the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we value ministry in Jesus' name. A little bit more about who we are. If you're visiting, there you go. If you're a longtime congregant, that's a good reminder for everyone. So looking forward to getting into Daniel a little bit more today and, and finding out about the um, expectations of him and his compatriots. Uh, we, everyone here, has been taught things in the past, and it changes our, or, or has an effect on our decisions later on. Daniel and his compatriots were taught things early on, thinking of Sunday school, early on, and how that affected them later when they were told different things that conflicted a bit will be interesting. What about yourselves? Maybe when you were young, you weren't taught certain things, but that had an impact on decisions later on in your life. We can change our thought process. We can learn, we can educate ourselves, and that will have an effect on us as well. We have decisions to make based upon all of that history. Daniel had decisions to make as well based upon his history. So think about, again, the importance of Sunday school and getting truth in at an early age. Yes, we can get it later. Sometimes it's harder. But we need to consider the importance of our youth, that they will grow and take our place later on. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege of being able to come together to worship you in various ways, in our singing, our giving, in our study of your word. Thank you that we have the technology to share that with those that aren't able to be with us in person. We thank you for those that are working in the background that aren't seen but are very necessary, whether it be the Sunday school teachers, the, war the ones that help out with chili, the cleaners, the it goes on and on. We thank you for all the hands that help and make it easier. We thank you for our pastor, for the word he will bring us from your word. And we love you, Lord, and we pray that our worship is uplifting to you as we learn and grow to be more Christ-like by hearing your word and listening to your spirit. We ask your blessings on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite now the worship team to come up and lead us.
<laughs> so Greg and I are doing this together because we figure we both each got half a voice left. So if we put ourselves together, we should be able to manage. <laughs> 50 and 50 is 100%. There you go. Would you guys like to stand with us? Lord of all creation Of water, earth, and sky The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are home I was kind of trying to think of songs that I thought maybe Daniel would, not that Daniel would know this song, but that maybe he might actually sing a song that sounded a little bit like this. And he for sure knew his psalms, at least, you know, probably a lot of them. So we're going to sing a song, psalm. <laughs>
You are my morning song. No darkness fills the night. It cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God You guys can have a seat for this last song. <clears throat> sovereign in the mountain air, sovereign on the ocean floor, with me in the calm, with me in the storm. Sovereign in my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry. me at the
trust you in your never failing love you work everything for good god whatever comes my way i will trust you god whatever comes my way i will trust you Well, good morning again. There was like four people when we started. It's just like a school situation. If you don't come on time, you don't come at all. I'm just, I'm just kidding. We, we would never do that simply because we cannot do that. But we are glad that you are here with us. Um, you can open to Daniel. We're going to do a little bit of recap uh, just because some of you uh, either may not have been here, or those of you who are watching at home may not have seen last week. And, and last week is essential. The context is essential for us to get a really good, proper understanding of the book of Daniel. So last week was an unusual sermon. It was essentially a uh, Bible history class where we went through... Uh, the, the context, what's happening, what has happened up to this point, what's going on with the people of Israel, and, and my argument for doing that and getting through all of but one verse was because when we really understand the context of where they're at and why they've come to this place and why all of a sudden these people are, are in captivity, in exile, all of a sudden the things about Daniel and his friends uh, those that serve God become far more meaningful and actually far more applicable to our lives. So let me give you just a real quick recap. Uh, and, and I'm going to clarify two things in here uh, because one, I gave you a date last week that while technically is correct, might have been a little confusing. So I'll address that. And another, uh, Lee came into my office on Tuesday uh, as, as he does, and we were chatting about some things. And I realized that it probably wasn't quite as clear on something about the, the 12 tribes of Israel. So I want to clarify that as well. So King Solomon, who is the son of King David, um, that's where the, the unified Israel came to its end. So all the tribes of Israel, all 12, were part of one nation. I mean, they still are part of one nation, but they were unified together under one king, and that was Solomon. But near, and Solomon did a, a really good job for most of his life. But as he neared the end of his life, he became obsessed with foreign women and had hundreds of wives um, that were from outside of these nations. And in the book of Exodus, God had warned uh, the Israelites not to do that because if they did, their hearts would be turned away from the one true God and they would begin to serve other gods. And, and you can read that in Exodus and kind of think, okay, God, you're being a little bit exaggerative, except the problem is that every time it happened, exactly what God warned them would happen, happened. And so you have uh, Solomon losing sight of focusing on the one true God, and he was building uh, other idols and, and even giving other places of worship to his foreign wives so that they would be able to serve their gods. And it actually said in the text that we read that Solomon began to worship those gods as well. So it's not as though Solomon was just like, okay, you can worship your God, but his own heart started going after them. And so you see idolatry start to become this big problem that, that actually never goes away in, in the Old Testament. And it becomes kind of part of these, uh, these Jewish people there, the Hebrew people there, I don't want to say it this way, but almost like their identity was we're no longer going to follow the one true God as we were called to, but we're going to follow all these other nations, their gods, their rituals, what they do, their deities, 
And then, and then God, in his grace and his mercy, would send a prophet and remind them, come back to me, and they would, they would come back sometimes. And, and it was just this massive cycle. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, takes over. And Rehoboam was uh, uh, one of the more wicked kings, and most of the kings from this point on were wicked. And Rehoboam decides, man, what should I do uh, as now that I am the, the ruling king? And so this is where Lee asked a question that I want to clarify. Where did the ten and the two kind of come from? The, the southern tribes of Judah are um, Judah, sorry, the southern tribes of Israel are Judah and Benjamin. But if you look on a map, you actually see that the tribe of Simeon is located in the south as well. And you're kind of thinking, how does this work? Well, the tribe of Simeon, according to scholars, had two kind of things. Some of them, they were the smallest tribe, and so some of them just kind of entered into the land of Judah and kind of partnered with Judah. But most of them uh, left their land and went up to partner with the north, basically because what had happened was Rehoboam, uh, was Solomon starting, started taxing all these other tribes more aggressively than Judah and Benjamin because of where their location was right next to Jerusalem. And so Simeon kind of joined the northern tribes. They uh, all approached King Rehoboam under the leadership of a guy named Jeroboam. This is why it's confusing, Rehoboam, Jeroboam. I'm sure if you're a, a Hebrew, these names are very unique, but to us it sounds so similar. And they say, man, if you, just, if you would just stop taxing us so aggressively, we'll follow you and, and we'll be united together. And Rehoboam wants power and he wants control. And so he taxes them harder, and then they rebel against them. And so the ten tribes unite Jeroboam king, and now the, there's two kingdoms, the northern and the southern. And even though Simeon is on the map southern, they join the northern tribes. And so now you have the north kind of versus the south, as it were. And in the year 722 B.C., the northern kingdoms were conquered by Assyria, and they went off into exile. And then the southern kingdoms started focusing not on God, not on worshiping him, but on their location. We live in Jerusalem or, or very near Jerusalem. And, and this is where the future Messiah is going to come. And so as long as we're here, we'll be fine. That's the focus of the southern tribes. Not as long as we follow after God, not as long as we submit to him, not as long as we wait for the coming Messiah to de- All their focus was, was as long as we live here, we're good. It doesn't matter how we live. And so God's mercy continues, but also you see some disciplines starting to come. And then in the year, uh, so I said last week in the year 586, the southern kingdoms were uh, exiled into uh, the Babylonian kingdom. And, And that date, 586, can be a little bit confusing. That's when the temple was burned down, and that was kind of the, the, the nail in the coffin, as it were. But here at the beginning of Daniel, what we're going to read, this actually started in 605, and so historically speaking, there was three different invasions uh, of the Babylonians coming down. The first was in 605 where they wiped out, they uh, took the king prisoner, they took, well, we're going to read some of this, they took other people, but over those next years, the devastation got worse and worse and worse until the temple signified everything. So the reason that I say that is because if you do some homework, and you start asking questions about uh, the, histor- the historical accuracy of the book of Daniel, you'll find a thread that talks about Daniel uh, in a sense of metaphor only. That God uh, was teaching the people something through a story, but Daniel, that his friends, uh, that these, even though Nebuchadnezzar was a real person, that this is all just metaphor and not real. And the reason for that is because of these dating systems. When you read in the third year in verse 1, which is 605 B.C., we start to go, okay, well, hold on, that doesn't line up with the Babylonian calendar. And so all I want to say with this is that if you study really hard your history, what you learn is that between the Hebrews and between the Babylonians, there were two different dating systems, not like dating boys versus girls, just to be clear, uh, different calendars that look out of place. And when you read them in the different, so if you find something from the Babylonian Empire and you read it, it's like, well, this contradicts this. But as soon as you actually do your homework enough to realize that these calendars are different and you start to reconcile those differences, you find that 605 becomes a very unified date. And in fact, in our own, well, in, I shouldn't say my own generation, but 
in Clara's generation, thanks for being here, Clara, in 1956, uh, some archaeologists actually found some tablets proving beyond any shadow of a doubt that the, histor- the historicity of Daniel is 100% accurate and there's no reason to deny. So I just want to share that with you in case you come across something and go, oh, I, I saw that maybe Daniel is more metaphor than literal. Well, that is an is a old belief that historians don't hold to any longer. So, This is the context. This is why it's so important. Because Daniel and his friends are about to go into exile with no hope, no longer a nation, wondering, is God actually going to fulfill his promise and bring the Messiah, even though we are no longer even a unified people? And Daniel, amidst all that uncertainty, all that chaos, remains faithful to God. And why is that so important to us? Because when our world falls apart all around us, when you don't know, what is God doing? Why is he allowing this to happen? Why are these things happening? We can, just like Daniel, trust that even though we don't see the details, we know that God is faithful. And so amidst our circumstances, we can choose to trust him. And that's why it's so applicable. So let's read these first seven verses together. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, used without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. You probably know them more by their Babylonian names, unless you're a little bit younger than me, then you probably know them by what? Rack, Shack, and Benny, that's correct. <laughs> Veggie tales might be good and funny, theologically not always the most accurate. So let's, let's, let's do the names here. We'll, we'll actually talk about that as we get there in a moment. Before we get into uh, going through a couple of these verses, let me just take you to a few structural things. And I actually wrote this, so I got to throw Ryan under the bus a little bit. Because I had so much faith in Ryan, but he let me down just a little bit. Every time we go through a new study, whether that's Sunday morning or whether that's uh, our men's group or whatever it is, before we even begin, before we even have our first meeting, Ryan's already watched the Bible Project video on either that book or that section or, or whatever it is. And so I actually wrote here, If you, like my friend Ryan, have already done this, but I asked him this morning, and he hasn't done it yet, so you're all in the same boat if you haven't done it. If you've watched uh, their video, and it's great, I was going to show it this morning, but just there's not enough time. What you'll find is there's a couple really interesting literary designs to this book that really, really help us. And this, in this, I should say, we're going to ask a couple of questions. The The book of Daniel, chapter one, is actually written in Hebrew like the rest of the Old Testament. But then chapters 2 to 7 take a shift and they're written in Aramaic. And then it goes back to Hebrew in chapters 8 to 12. Does that seem strange to anyone? It's very unusual. And it's meant to be that because the original readers of the book of Daniel, most likely, like 99%, they'd be able to read both Hebrew and Aramaic because it's a cousin language, very similar, but different. The language of Hebrew was written for God, or, or is spoken by God's covenant chosen people, the Israelites, Aramaic, a wider language beyond. And so when they were reading through this, they would see this and go, this is intentional. There's a point to this. First question that I want to ask then, are we then at a disadvantage in English when we read through this and we don't see that pattern? The answer, as always, yes and no. 
yes, if you have uh, the time and, and your brain works this way and you can learn the Hebrew and the Greek and Aramaic, then absolutely that'll be the absolute best way to go. Is if you could read through the original texts, the way that they're constructed, then that is going to be of benefit to you, 100%. Spoiler alert, I do not know Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic. And so I think also the answer is no. If you go to a, a Christian bookstore or you, for that matter, go to Amazon and you order a really good study Bible, you'll have a few pages before the book that will go through things like Date, authorship, theme, purpose, occasion, background, um, literary features, design, all of those things are in there and it only takes you an extra 10 minutes to read that and you'll find all of those things before you even get to chapter 1, verse 1. So it's not a disadvantage, at least not, not a big one. All we have to do is put in a little bit of effort and realize we will see, if we look hard enough, what the original readers would have seen. So you're not at a disadvantage, speaking English. So when we think about this literary design structure, what the commentators tell us is that chapters 2 to 7 are meant to be written in this different language so that we look at this and go, this is one unique section of text that we need to read this from 2 to 7, all within one theme. And then we need to read 8 to 12 with interpreting that based on what's happened in 2 to 7. That's the first thing. And the second thing they tell us is that this design, which is, which is a, uh, not a unique thing to biblical literature, but in ancient literature this was a, a, quite a common thing, was that meant that chapter 2 and chapter 7 become hinge points. So they become the important chapters to uh, interpret the rest of the book through the lens of 2 and 7. So when we get to chapter 2 in six months, I'm just kidding, in two weeks, I hope, when we get to chapter 2, and then when we eventually get to chapter 7, and then go into 8 and 12, we're going to make those connections. So we're going to ask those questions. How can we understand 8 to 12 now in light of what we have read in 2 to 7, specifically 2 and 7? So there's just the unique structure of some things that you probably, when you sit down and just read it through, aren't going to initially notice. Praise the Lord, there's some really good Bible nerds that really study hard and try and learn these things so that we can understand them, so that we can see them, and that we don't have to be experts in language or culture, but we can actually just go to some study resources that really help. So, that's the structure and the design. So then we read last week, in 605 BC, the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar came to Babylon and he besieged it. Verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. We actually see this very, very well in English. They've done a good job of translating that sentence for us. But there's a really unique thing. Now, again, if you are a Bible nerd, and I would really encourage you to become one, um, that word, Lord, what do you notice about it in verse 2? And the Lord. Is there anything unique that stands out about that? The vast majority of the time in the Old Testament, the word Lord, when you see it in your English translation, will be capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. What does that word mean? That's Yahweh. That's God's covenant name to his nation Israel. So when that's the, by far the most used example of that. So when you in English are reading and you see that word Lord translated and it's not capital, 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 you can go, oh, this is, this is a different usage of God's name. What does this mean? And, and a little quick search, and there's actually some really good language tools online where you can see English and then the Hebrew right beside. It's free. You can find those things. Uh, and, and then you can click on that. And the word here is Adonai. And the reason that Daniel uses that instead of the covenant people is very, very actually significant. One commentator said it, uh, said it this way. If I can find it. God, the, sorry, the name of God Adonai here is used to emphasize one thing, God's sovereignty. That's what the word Adonai focuses on. God is at work. It wasn't as though Nebuchadnezzar conquered God's people and that God was unable to do anything about it. It's saying that God orchestrated 
all of this. And I think the English does a good job to say that. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. The commentator Stephen Miller says, it's not Nebuchadnezzar's military might or his brilliance that brought about the, down, the downfall of Jerusalem, but it was the sovereign will of God. This is God's plan. And, and if you need kind of further proof, if you're kind of thinking, well, that you're maybe reading into the text. In Deuteronomy 28, Moses predicts that Israel would go into captivity as a consequence for forsaking the Lord. All these things are written through the Old Testament. We see them. They're pointing towards. And what Daniel is doing, and again, I think this is really significant, because Daniel's been hauled off into exile, and now he's, he's having to learn all about the Babylonian culture and to serve the king, all these things. And he still looks at it, and he goes, this was God's orchestrated plan because of our nation's disobedience. You may remember back to the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah has an encounter with God, and, and he falls on his knees. He says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Now, as far as we know, Isaiah was actually doing what was good and right and following after God. And he could have had a me versus them kind of approach. And Daniel could have had that too. And we're going to see that Daniel doesn't. But he identifies himself with his people. Is as a collective whole, the Israelites were not following God. And Isaiah, Daniel, many others in Scripture, when they have an encounter with God, they recognize that. And they don't go, you know, I've been really good, but the whole nation sucks. They go... I live amongst these people. These are my people, and we are not following after you. There's an there's a ownership of that. And so even in the midst of all of these things happening to Daniel, he doesn't look at it in the sense of Nebuchadnezzar has overthrown God. No, this is God's plan because God is still at work. And God is going to use this. So you may remember what Joseph says about when he gets abandoned by his brothers. He says, you meant this for evil, but... God meant it for good. Is even in the midst of all that we look at and we go, I cannot see how God could be at work here, we see some of the biblical characters refuse to let go of that. God is sovereign. He is at work. None of this has caught him by surprise. None of it has caught him off guard. And so Daniel continues to believe that. Then he says this, he gave them into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. He brought them to the land of Shiner, to the house of God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Seems like a, just like a small detail point. And then he moves on to now we're going to talk about the people and what all that means. So when you come across a verse like that that seems like that's a strange detail to include, what does that usually mean? It's pretty important. It's pretty significant. In this case, why is it important? Well, in Isaiah 39, we're going to put the text up in just a second here, but in Isaiah 39, we read about the story of King Hezekiah. By and large, King Hezekiah was one of the few good kings, but like all of us, he let his own pride get the better of him sometimes. And what happens is the king of Babylon's son at that point, there's, there's not the animosity that exists right now, of course, but he comes and there's a conversation that happens and Hezekiah gets very proud of all his spoils of war, all the things that have been conquered by the Israelites. And he invites the king's son in to see all these vessels, all these things that he has had. And he's like, I'm just so proud of our conquering ability. And God rebukes him through Isaiah. And so in verse 5 and 6 of chapter 39, Isaiah says this, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. So why is that verse in Daniel? Again, Daniel's really hitting home the sovereignty of God here. Look, God already said this was going to happen. This was punishment in, in some sense because Hezekiah would not do, would not humble himself but had so much arrogance and, and, and showed all these things to kind of brag about his ability rather than God. And God says, look, 
This is not a good thing that you have done. And through the voice of Isaiah, a prophecy is told. And so for us, it might just seem like this little verse that we can kind of go through and go, okay. But actually, it's pointing us back to, look, God is faithful to his promises and to what he says, even if we don't really like all those promises. Hezekiah disobeyed God, and here was a consequence of that. The second thing to note, and this is quite interesting, is anybody know where the land of Shiner is? The land of Shiner is literally the site which the Tower of Babel was built. So what King Nebuchadnezzar is doing here, this this Shiner area was opposition to the one true God. They failed when they built the Tower of Babel because God simply went, no, you're not going to do this. And so Nebuchadnezzar, in his own arrogance, in his own pride, goes, I have conquered that king of the Jews, that that, that Hebrew king. And so I'm going to take everything of him, of his, in his temple that's meant to worship him, and I'm going to put it in my land where the Tower of Babel was, because this is opposition to God. I find that super interesting. Maybe my Bible nerd stuff is coming out more and more. I find all these little details in the text as, as we start to read really deeply and really go back in history and to see all these little things that God puts into place It really just shows the magnificence of him, of how he has orchestrated the Bible together so that we can actually know that it's trustworthy and it's it's accurate. I think it's amazing. So now the, the focus of it all on the people. So the chief eunuch comes and he gets those of the royal family and the nobility, uh, all four of the, the guys that are said here, all from the line of Judah. And actually there's a, 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 a great deal of proof to suggest that actually Daniel was of royal birth, that he was uh, in the line, lineage of King Zedekiah. And so him and his three friends were actually quite well um, ranked people But this is what's really stood out to me this week again. And I don't know if this is my Sunday school days kind of influencing the way that I think. But when I think about the book of Daniel, when I read through and you, you, you you read about the lion's den or the fiery furnace or all these kinds of things, in my mind, Daniel is this very wise, mature man, and he's always got a beard because in Sunday school, every man seems to have a beard, and it just rubs it in my face. That's actually not exactly how I meant to say that, but that's okay. But the truth of the matter here is that Daniel is writing to us so that we would understand that Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, they are 14 years old. And that we'll, they'll spend three years being inundated with Babylonian culture. Uh, we'll explain that in just a minute. And so that by the time that they finished that, they would be 17 years old. The fact that Daniel and his friends are so committed to God when they are so young, the maturity that they show completely blows my mind. And so, I, again, I don't know if it's this stuck idea in my Sunday school of all these old bearded fellows going, like, we are mature men who, they're, they're just kids. Like, my son's 10. And to think of him in four years being dragged off into exile and to be taught everything about another culture, another time, and to, and to subvert the one true God, like, that's a terrifying thought. And to go 14, 15, 16, 17-year-old kids were faithful, that believed God fully. And and as we know the story of, of the book of Daniel, they were committed to him. I think that is amazing. Now notice what it says about what Nebuchadnezzar values. So first he goes in to get the, ro- uh, the royal family and nobility. That's a, that's a normal thing. They go in and they take all the key people out because that, that weakens their political structure. So he takes them out. But then it says, youths without blemish, good appearance, skillful in all wisdom. And then there's this, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competence to stand in the king's palace. History teaches that that Nebuchadnezzar valued one thing more than anything, knowledge. 
As long as he could get enough knowledge, he viewed himself essentially as a God, that he could do all things because he knew all things. That it was what uh, his focus was. So he gets these people. They're going to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. That's the, the cultural people of the Babylonians. The king assigns them a daily portion of food and, that he ate and the wine that he drank. That's not to mean that they actually ate or drank with the king, but that they were to be cared for with utmost um, care, I guess is the right way to say it, but a very selfish care because what's the goal? To force a dependence upon the king so that he becomes your ruler. I give you your food. I give you your drink. I can take it away. They were going to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they would stand before the king. And then all of a sudden, these guys are given. These four men specifically are talked about. Commentator Ian Dugood points it out this way. He says, Nebuchadnezzar sought to assimilate the exiles into Babylonian culture by obliterating obliterating their religious and cultural identity and creating dependence upon the royal court. That's the goal. That stood out to me so significantly, again, probably because I have a child near that age. But in our time in youth ministry, what I learned, um, what I saw, what I experienced, teenagers can, can, can be the best of the best and the worst of both spheres. Those of you who have had kids that have grown up, you know exactly what I'm saying. They can bring you the most joy. You can be so proud of them. You can see them do amazing things. And you can also see them make just some of the most, what you would define as boneheaded decisions imagine. And guess what? You did the same when you were that age too. Let's not forget that. History just keeps repeating itself. But so for me to think about these 14-year-olds being taken away from their families, they would no longer have everything that they did so that they would know who God was. They didn't have what we have today. They don't have a church family to go to. They didn't have Sunday school classes to go to. They didn't have a youth group to go to. They didn't have a smartphone with the Bible on it. They only had each other and their faith and belief that God would protect them and care for them. That's it. And yet what we see is there were some, and, and I'm not trying to suggest this is some kind of pattern, and if you do this as a parent, it'll all work out. Uh, it's not that simple. But what we see here is that the hand of God was on these four young men, and that despite the king's best effort to ruin their identity and to turn them into essentially robots who served himself, is they were faithful to the one true living God. So if you're a parent this morning, and if you have children that you do not know what to do with today. Or you have grown up children that you look at the decisions and the choices they're making and you see that it's just it's hurting their lives and you wish you could do something more. Is know that God is sovereign. That he is in control. As I was reading through all this and as I was letting this kind of impact me, a verse that Jesus says in John 20, uh, 10, 28 to 30 came to mind. It says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. For my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. There is not a more comforting text to me in all of the Bible when I think of my child. If he has committed his life to Jesus, then I know that Jesus holds on to him and he will never let go. That is a promise that we as parents can cling to. Despite maybe seeing some very difficult moments, despite seeing some, again, what we would define really boneheaded decisions and forgetting that we made our fair share of them. It can be so easy to be like, what am I doing? I, gotta, I wish I could do something better or right. Is, is parents, you have a God-given responsibility to teach your children who God is and to model your love for Jesus to them. But praise the Lord that their salvation is not up to you. God loves them far more than you could ever understand. 
And so that should give us great courage and great hope amidst what might be some very difficult circumstances. Because God is sovereign. Because if God can save these four young men, and we're going to read all about the amazing things that they do when they're 14 years old and they don't have any of the advantages that we have nowadays. All they had was each other and God, and yet God brought them through. That can give us hope that God, then that reminder that God is sovereign. I want to focus real quickly on one last thing, and, and this is the name changes that happen. It's interesting to me that Daniel we know as Daniel, but the other three we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as if somehow those names are easier to say than their Hebrew names. But I don't think that that's true, and it's just, I, I don't really have an answer for that. It's just this wondering for me, and, and we don't think of Daniel as Belteshazzar. We just think of him as Daniel. Well, let me tell you what their names meant, and, and this just further proves um, what the commentator that I read talked about. Nebuchadnezzar is trying to assimilate them into culture and obliterating their religious and cultural identity because Daniel literally means in Hebrew, God is my judge. So the king goes, well, we can't have that. So let's give him this new name, Belteshazzar, which means essentially wife or lady of the god Bel, protect the king. So he's given his identity of God is my judge, to now you are actually going to help this other God. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. So this God, this covenant God is gracious to us. Well, his name gets changed to what essentially means this, command of Aku, who is the moon God of Babylon. Yahweh is gracious, well now you serve the the moon god. Azariah was, uh, sorry, pardon me, Michelle is, literally means this, who is what God is? The idea there is simply this, is there is no God like our God. You read that all through the Old Testament over and over and over, especially in the Psalms. Who is there like the one true God? That's what his name means. Well, it gets changed to who is like Aku, which again is the moon god. Azariah's name meant Yahweh has helped. And now it would be changed to servant of the shining one who is Nebo, another one of their gods. Their names had significance and meaning about their culture, their heritage, about their love for their one true God. And the king of Babylon goes, not only am I going to take you exile, not only am I going to take you away from your people and what you know, we're going to inundate you in our culture and our customs in our ways, and I'm even going to change your name so that every time somebody says your name, it has something to do with the reference of our gods, not yours. Literally, there is nothing going their way, except for one thing, that God is holding on to them, and that he won't let go. As we study through the rest of Daniel, as we think about how it relates to our lives, to our children, to our family, to our friends, is may we rest in this promise in John 10, 28, that Jesus holds on to us, and so it does not matter what the world throws at us. It does not matter how difficult it gets. It does not matter what your circumstance happens. It doesn't matter how overwhelmed you might feel, and it doesn't matter what the evidence looks like on the surface, is what we'll see later on, many, many years later, probably in eternity is that God had purpose and had plan in all of those things. And he was bringing it about so that we would cling to him more and so that he would use us for his glory and his honor so that others would come to faith in Jesus. That is what we see in the life of Daniel and his friends. I pray that that's what God does in us. So your circumstance, your hurt, your pain, your uncertainty, none of it's caught God by surprise. God knows what he's doing. And he's allowed these things into your life. He's orchestrated some of them into your life with purpose and meaning. And I can't be the one to tell you exactly what those are. I wish it all just worked out so easily for Daniel, uh, as it did for Daniel and his three friends. Oh, except for this, that they got thrown into a lion's den. And they got thrown into a fiery furnace. And they were tricked 
and they were lied to and they were tried to be killed over and over again. Yet we look back and we go, yet God was faithful. If we can believe God can be faithful in those things, then don't we think God can be faithful in our circumstance that we find ourselves in now? Let's pray. God, thank you for even these short verses that we've read this morning for your sovereignty, that you are in control, that even when it appears from our perspective that all hope is lost, God, when we look to you, we can see and we can know you have not abandoned us. You have not been conquered by some other king or nation, but that you are at work. You are at work because you want to redeem people from all over the place. And so, God, I pray that we would see that, that we would know that, that, that we would rest in this promise that you hold on to us so tightly. And as we recognize that, may we live for you so that others would know there is a king. His name is Jesus. God, would you give us the courage this week to live for you, despite what our circumstances might look like us, or what they might feel like to us. Help us to know that you have purpose, you have meaning. God, help us to trust you this morning. God, for those this morning who are struggling with uncertainty of children, whether young or whether grown, may we rest in a text like this to know that you are in control that you love them far more than we do and you can bring them through any and every situation. So may we trust you this morning. God, as we dive further into this, may we learn how to be more faithful. May we learn how to submit to your Holy Spirit and not our own. May we learn to follow after you and trust you because we know that you are the one true God. We love you. Go with us this week now. Amen. Thank you for joining us again this morning. We look forward to seeing you again next week. And as, as Lee mentioned, uh, if you have any needs or, or flip that even further, if you know anybody that has needs, if you have a neighbor that has some kind of a need, but you, for whatever reason, are unable to help, just let us know. We want to make sure that we're serving our community to the best of our ability so that we can show them who Jesus is. So thank you. Hope you have a wonderful week. See you.